So after we move on to the webinar, I would like to um, present to you our um, speakers. So I will speak about Alexandre Jolie Lavoie first. He has a BA in uh, teaching and didactics and uh, has uh, worked as a pedagogical advisor in primary and secondary uh, schools um, in uh, history. He also worked uh, at the college level in the development of digital resources. Uh, he has been working now, um, or he newly integrated the uh, Ministère de l'Éducation Supérieure, and uh, he uh, is working on the use of video games um, for teaching purposes and in the use of uh, AI in uh, pedagogy. So Catherine, Catherine Vien has a BA in uh, education and a master's in education from the University of Montreal as well. She completed a short uh, um, program um, in superior studies at UCAM, also specializing in education and technologies. She um, works at the collegial uh, level and at the university level. She specializes in remote learning and uh, digital transformation in higher learning. So have a very nice webinar, everyone. Thank you, Nicole. So. Welcome everyone, and Catherine, I will uh, let you share your screen. So first of all, uh, thank you for being here in such great number. I feel that I have to say to start that what I say today only involves myself and not the uh, Ministère de l'Éducation Supérieure. Um, so uh, there are three segments of the presentation. Uh, and I will explain why we decided to proceed this way, actually. We will uh, give a little introduction and then uh, move on to tell you four uh, practice-based stories um, about AI, and then we'll have a little conclusion uh, and we'll answer your questions, the questions that you will write to us in the Q&A section. So we will start with that little introduction. So why are we giving this presentation today? Very quickly, what must be understood is that when Nicole approached us to give this presentation, she wanted us to go over pretty much what we did at our own college uh, last March. And we realized very quickly that it wasn't possible. It wasn't realistic in the sense that uh, that presentation was already was already obsolete. <laughs> so we talked about it. Um, and uh, Catherine and myself were already asking ourselves some questions regarding what it meant um, or what what that uh, educational posture could be in uh, AI and if we should use it in our professional practice. And if we were using AI for we being um if we're if we're being traders if we're uh traders or as our professional uh, duties right so we thought perhaps we could just share share this whole um issue with other people who are also teaching and we uh, speak about posture right so who are we uh, what is our position as um uh, pedagogical experts, as techno-pedagogical experts, and why uh, perhaps uh, sometimes we may feel like we're not necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily feel in our place, right? Um, I am a pedagogical advisor and I use a whole bunch of tools and uh, AI comes and um, comes and, and, and questions a lot of the things that I used to be doing, a lot of the tools that I have been using in the past, right? So in the context of my practice, I um, have had the opportunity of working on uh, technological, digital uh, tools, uh, and then AI came in. AI came in and is changing everything a bit, right? Um, digital tools remain though, the, the whole digital uh, dimension remains a tool. So if we're going to use digital things in our practice, it needs to bring added value. It's not something that we just add 
out of pleasure. It, great if it brings us pleasure, but if in, it, if it's meant to be pedagogical, then it actually needs to lead us to something better that allows us to improve learning experiences, right? So you have uh, two pieces to this, two dimensions. You always need to keep in mind that um, digital, the digital is a tool, not an end in itself. And this is where another dimension comes in, right? So it's AI. Um, I wanted to speak about the storm, right? I'm putting you back in that context now in March, April. Um, actually, when we came back from the holidays in 2020, um, Three, everybody was talking about chat GPT, right? It was the end. We were never going to be able to teach like we did before. Everything would have to change. And then very quickly, a kind of reflection process imposed itself um, because we had a lot of questions, a lot of questioning. And we thought, okay, we're going to take a first step and we're going to do a first we're going to do one first thing just to calm things down and uh, get conversation going. Uh, with regards to this topic. So this is a presentation that I was mentioning at the beginning where we mentioned basically what AI was and what we would do with it. So let's uh, keep going. So what we wanted to do is uh, offer a first step, right? To help people to get the conversation going. And what uh, we realized no, actually, we're just going forward, progressing, things are calming down a bit. So we realized that, yeah, ChatGPT allows you to do uh, so many things, a women's journey as well. Um, but things are just getting calmer and uh, and uh, we keep teaching, doing whatever we do. Um, and then this will turn into one of our practice-based stories, actually, we get to a point where uh, Catherine and myself, we have these tasks that we need to do, right? And uh, it will perhaps require that we use AI. And this is where we started our asking ourselves these questions, like maybe we could use AI, right? Are we imposters if we use AI? And we started thinking, huh, well, Eureka, no, perhaps it could be a good thing. Perhaps it could help us. Uh, lessen the burden of our daily tasks. And this is what brings us to this, this posture that I was talking about, right? Uh, this position that we could adopt, uh, that is that uh, the digital remains a tool. It remains an element that can be uh, relevant, can bring added value in our pedagogical practices, but it is not necessarily the the end in itself or an end in itself. And AI is just one tool, one tool among others. And this is what we'll try and, and expose to you today, illustrate to you today, to see how um, AI can come and support us in our tasks as a teachers at the college level. So I will let Catherine take over now. All right, so for myself, what uh, allows me to be where I am today as a techno um, pedagogical expert, well, I have a lot of uh, I have an educational background in uh, um, pedagogy, but I've always had a focus on technology, right? How it could be used. I think I think that at the beginning, the only association for um, pedagogical ex Birds uh, that focus on technology was called crapaud, crapu. I don't know, but it was like that. But there was just that one, and uh, eventually it became the repti. But my interest for pedagogy and um, for technology and pedagogy always remained very, very present. And I was looking at the way in which you could use um, technology with kids uh, in a playful way to help them learn. And my focus was always um, to ask myself if technology was serving the purpose well, if it needed to be very predominant or um, what its place really was. And for me, it's pedagogy that led me to techno pedagogy because I was always very curious, actually. It's curiosity that led me there. And with the teachers that I would meet, I would always ask myself, you know, what can we do? We're brainstorming, we're looking at everything together. And 
we would see um, new ideas emerge. And so this being said, with regards to everything that is going on today, I and, and speaking about my background and my journey, you know, I was there at the beginning of internet when you would have these sounds, you know, when you would connect and all of that. But, you know, at the beginning, you were like, wow, what's that? What's the potential there? There was so many ideas. Uh, there were websites um, coming out at the be beginning on um, uh, learning activities that you could lead with kids, right? And I, you would search through them, but it was really like uh, trying to find a hidden gem. You know, there was a lot, but you would really have to go through it. And I would work with associations that did media education at the beginning. And uh, for media edu education, we're already in that posture, in that position, adopting that posture position where we would say if internet is already um, available to children in primary and secondary school we must already um, develop their critical thinking because there's a lot of marketing on the internet right and people look for information but what they find is not always real information so um, the questions that were being raised there um, already then, you know, when the internet came out, um, questions regarding media education are so very relevant uh, and even more relevant as AI is taking up more and more space in society. So now uh, remember, or I want to mention that these images were able to uh, find them uh, through websites that are making uh that are making images available through ai for example firefly and uh, bing so you can see our curiosity uh, leads us to experimentation because curiosity always leads to experiment experimentation so we really had fun when preparing this um presentation and we were able to test um drawing or image generation tools uh putting together this presentation and you know what the AI is too is so simple and even just you know um powerpoints uh, it becomes a tool through oh so so like a powerpoint even when you start using its functions um you uh, kind of realize that in itself it is a sort of AI a an AI device because putting together a presentation, they'll have offer designs, um, suggestions, uh, color palettes, uh, everything. So, um, Alexandre, back to you for the first practice based story. Amazing. Thank you. And I think that one important element that should be specified here is that neither Catherine or myself present ourselves as AI experts. We're just playing around with it. Uh, we do many, many things. We're very curious, but we're actually just like taking steps, taking steps. We're, we're in a process of learning. We're in a process of exploring and we're assisting um, teachers um, and ourselves. We're still looking at uh, we're looking to find, you know, that that hidden gem or that perfect position or that perfect. That perfect stance. Um, so. Just for a little of context, background at the Cégep de Grande Bay, we wanted to establish a new orientation framework where people would have uh, references um, to develop uh, digital practices and tools. And uh, this needed to be part of our new strategic development plan. So, so we were just consulting each other. We're meeting a lot of people. We're um, finding um, documentation um, outside the CEGEP. We just find a lot of sources, you know, uh, documents that were hundreds of pages long, a lot of uh, notes that we would find and, and everything. And we needed to summarize all of that. You can have an idea of what it looked like in our OneNotes, right? We had so much so much content um, so many so much data and we thought okay we need to give this some kind of shape and we've done this forever it is uh, these are skills that I did develop throughout my superior studies at the doctorate level and so I can do this but at the same time I was thinking you know what do I really need to be the one to do this uh, can I not ask artificial intelligence to help me because this was my first discomfort that I felt um, this is where I started thinking okay Catherine are we doing the right thing so 
let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I was, I thought, okay, let's just try. Let's just try out of curiosity. We're going to find a tool and uh, we're going to provide documents to this tool and we're going to look at what it pulls out for us, what it produces for us, right? And the first, uh, the version that I obtained from this run um, that we did through um, PDF AI, uh, this was the tool that we used. Uh, what it does actually is that you upload a document and then you just speak to it, literally. You just talk to it. So it's very close to ChatGPT. So you tell them, you know, we told them, okay, summarize this for me and pull out the main ideas, clusters of ideas, etc. And then we uploaded this, gave instructions, and within a few hours, uh, and we were working, among other things, with the report from this D SE, so we were able to go through a large quantity of documents within a few hours, and this allowed us to summarize quickly. So we ended up with the first summary of official documents of our working notes. And so we thought, all right, great. Uh, AI supported us with this, but we can't just take this at face value, right? We need to do our own work. So that's where our own summary work, our own summarization work started. So how did this end up showing the added value of AI? Well, actually, it's because we uh, offloaded the, the um, cognitive burden the very laborious uh, task of needed to go and pull out the key elements and cluster ideas together. And we asked AI to pull this out and then we produced our summary, our own synthesis, right? So um, it pulled out all of the key concepts. And then after that, it still required human intervention. And so this is where we were able to really mobilize the whole of our skills to generate what you see now on screen. So this is a summary of the summary. It's a synthesis. And now, uh, you know, the whole calculation power that we have as professionals, right? That, you know, to take all of this and and give it meaning and adjust it to our needs and adapt it to our environment. This is what it allowed us. So AI here, it supported us. It didn't replace, replace us, it complemented us. But at the beginning, we felt very uncomfortable because you, know, you think about all of these skills that you developed throughout the years and you're thinking, okay, now I'm just taking this thing to do it, but actually it helps you go even further. So now Catherine will show you another example of AI assisted tax. So tasks. So this is a, a context in which I had prepared a course for a university level. And uh, it was a remote class, remote course. And uh, Oftentimes, with uh, my working experience, I have had to work with the teachers that uh, that ask themselves, you know, how they can go from a framework and then offer a macro planning of their course outlines and then just really go into detail. So like macro plan planning and then actually go into the micro planning of each um, each class, what is going to be proposed, what material is going to be used, at what moment, and uh, here, and um, we were in a context in in which I was exposing myself to this process. I had to put together my own um, lesson plan uh, to offer a course on didactics, and so I was giving examples uh, from my experience in the field in the previous years. And what I did first is I thought, okay, I'm gonna take a few notes and I'll try and uh, I'll just explore, explore the material that I have here and, and try and convey what I have seen, what, what, what I face in the field and uh, explain 
uh, what I see when I assist teachers and, and what I go through myself when I put together lesson plans. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm going to proceed using charts. I'm going to have these figures, um, diagrams, and then I'm going to be um, cutting and pasting, moving things around. And at some point I thought, all right, am I on the right track? Because I was going from experience to consistency conceptual, right? I was going from experience to concepts. And I thought, are the teachers are going to be able to follow me? Because, you know, I'm in my head. I know what I think, but are they going to be able to follow me? And I was wondering, does that all make sense, basically? And so I started presenting segments of my own lesson plan to uh, chat GPT, using it uh, to challenge me, right? And so that was in 2023 that I gave this uh, course and with the launch of chat gpt it was a big news right that everybody was asking themselves you know what is this thing what can it do and how can i push it um to my advantage and so i was i, I was um having fun just challenging chat gpt and feeding it right and and as i would challenge it it would actually shape my material and the ideas of lesson plans that i had um it became stronger as I challenge chat GPT and as it would answer me, because sometimes I would think, okay, I'm not really sure that chat GPT's proposition or suggestion is um, interesting here, but I would take whatever it suggested to me and then I would remodel it or I would reshape it and feed it back, et cetera, et cetera. It was in the first uh, or it was during the first accesses that we had to chat GPT because, you know, I felt uncomfortable. I was in a position where I was myself going to teach didactics at the university level, and there were elements that I want to refresh in terms of my own skills. Chat GPT is offering me good answers and um, definitions to bring in the whole conceptual aspect Um for, for the theory that I had to present in my classes. But at the same time, you know, I was asking ChatGPT to assist me as a specialist. Uh, I'm a teacher specializing in didactics and, you know, we are the people who are bringing these skills, this knowledge to the students, and we're using an external tool to do so. And you're asking yourself, you know, should I really use this shortcut? And is it really a shortcut? And I was having this discussion with the teachers um, from a department at the same time. And there was one that was that said, you know, well, yeah, one of them said, uh, I'm really not comfortable if one of my colleagues starts using this tool to put together their lesson plans, because at some point there's going to be um, uniformization of lesson plans. Uh, lesson plans are not going to cover the essential content. Um, and uh, that's where Alexandre and myself starting, started reflecting. Um, for example, uh, we asked this teacher, you know, can we necessarily take the lesson plan as presented by chat GPT and take it for granted that it's it's good and that's what you're going to teach? Well, that's not the point. Um, in the end, we will always have to look at the whole picture, we are always going to have an idea uh, that uh, of what we want to achieve in a course. Uh, we will always bring our own nuances, our own metaphors, our own teaching modalities. So we're always going to be the people who um, come and improve or adapt uh, the material that is uh, presented to us by an external digital platform. So I'm just going to show you some examples of this process that I had, um, that I underwent in 2023. These are all examples that are uh, interesting. So I know that you can't read easily uh, off of the PowerPoint, but if uh, the PowerPoint is sent to you afterward, you're going to be able to read more, more easily. And um, these are the notes I was taking. Basically, I had these columns and I thought, okay, if I just establish some topics, big topics, uh, what are going to be the um, 
elements of content uh, that I need to cover and what resources are going to be used here and there, what are the readings that are going to be available for uh, the student to dig deeper into one topic. And then I would ask ChatGPT to go a bit um, further, to dig a bit further. And sometimes I would uh, input some uh, excerpts from my own text. Uh, I would say, if I propose this paragraph to you, if I have a version of a course that uh, I already have together, can you extrapolate something from that? Um, you know, provide me with some objectives or some uh, some kind of structure that I could reuse. And so I had uh, interesting conversations in the way that I would challenge chat GPT with the structure and uh, the notes that I had taken myself, you know, even on paper. So here, looking at the objectives, the requests um, for lesson plans, uh, you can See what it would propose to me. So um, here you have uh, so you, you can see you can see the titles of each uh, segment, right? Uh, what they would come up with would be um, resource uh, databases, uh, uh, conceptual, theoretical, conceptual, uh, didactical activities. Uh, so you can see the rewording basically between the two sections, what I inputted and what uh, came out of chat GPT. And you can see that even with their, uh, the result uh, provided by chat GPT, it would suggest a few paths to go forward and uh, put together our evaluation material. Um, so even when my topics were well established, I could say, you know, I want to speak about uh, didactics and the reconfiguration of practices. What do you think about it? And then it would tell me, for example, oh, it may make sense to start with fundamental concepts before moving on to more practical aspects, such as campus or distance orientation. It may also be useful to discuss learning theories and the pedagogy triangle before discussing FED and the content, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, as we went forward, uh, things would become more refined and I, it would come down to these concepts or these pillars that I consider to be essential. And um, slowly, I would be able to start choosing from the elements that were proposed to me. Chat GPT was uh, presenting some elements of content uh, within one topic, but in the um, progression or the sequence that I thought that I would adopt for my course, I would be able to say, you know, you I want to move this so that it's in third place, because if I want to talk about media and mediatization, uh, this is more theoretical. I'll do it in the first class, but then this comes in third place or um, whatever. So this is how I was able to structure the global um lesson plan and uh, going class by class. These were classes that were given these were whole day classes, right? And uh, I had my lesson plan. Um, each uh, court, uh, class topic was established, but then afterwards, you know, within each class, I had to think, okay, what's going to be my scenario for the day? You know, this day is uh, is dedicated to this topic, but how, how am I going to go through the content during that class? So it wasn't just about the lesson plan and um, the overall structure, but it was actually about building now the structure for each class and seeing how I could structure my presentation to students and um, how I could pull out some uh, other resources to uh, push the content a bit further. So I could, um, for example, uh, ask ChatGPT about uh, general concept, ask them um, how they would define uh, this or this term. Um, so it, it would help me uh, come up with explanations that supported the, the um, practical experience that I had to present. And so sometimes I would have fun just bringing it all back to a synthesis, right? A summary, because you can ask ChatGPT to remodel, to reshape um, the information that you 
input it, you can ask ChatGPT to go back to the essential ID uh, behind all of the questions and the exchanges that uh, went on. So this is the process that was quite rich that allowed us uh, or that allows me now to speak more about the use of AI and um, to other teachers who are curious about uh, it. And a third story now, it is about AI-generated videos. So here we had uh, a video uh, that uh, was going to be put online about uh, skills acknowledgement, the acknowledgement of skills, uh, reconnaissance is a key in French. Uh, so it, it was for students who needed uh, to get their uh, skills, their previous knowledge uh, assessed uh, for it to be recognized for credits, right? And so uh, we wanted to have a video to tell people how to um, undergo this process and I asked myself I want to give an introduction that will um, that will allow me to bond with the student that will um, make the student want to start to go forward with the process and uh, so I asked myself you know with the launch of all of these tools these new tools are there any um are there any tools that will allow me to not start with just a blank page, but actually um, have some have some material to start with? Because I'm one of these people who just doesn't like a blank page, right? So I thought, all right, good. I'm just going to go and look if there are AI tools that can help me generate a video. So to know which ones were the best, just not to start throwing myself everywhere or... Um, exploring too widely, well, I... Uh, did a search in Google and asked what uh, would be good AI tools to help me generate a video. And then I obtained a, a research a list of uh, search results. And then I started testing them. I started testing these tools saying, okay, generate a video using these criteria with this with some ideas that I had already come up with. So I did a few of them and I'll show you three um, shortly. For each result that I received, I wasn't 100% uh, satisfied. There was one that I would say, ah, this part, yeah, maybe, but that part, oh, not sure. But uh, so it's basically after one day of assessing and experimenting, I went back to square one. Basically, I thought, you know, that's not working for me. Maybe I didn't land on the right tool for me, or perhaps it's just that I really have my own idea in mind and I want to keep going with my own idea, right? So um, there, I'm just going to elaborate. I'm just going to uh, write the text myself and then it's just going to be uh red in the video so uh this is uh, uh a text an initial text that i would be able to uh to input for a video production through ai and i have my little idea in mind i would like uh, the person so i would like this text to be used i want someone also who's perhaps a supervisor um a production supervisor to speak and make this text a lot more um a lot more you know like human uh, a lot more relatable for the student so i give them the text and uh, these are the tools that i had available to me um to do these tests uh, lumen 5 synthesis 1 lumen 5 i think uh, would change names it's so very uh, used hey jen it's another one and the uh, in video is another one so this is among the tools that i uh, tested uh, the ones that i like the most so synthesia lumen and in video i'll show you the results that i got out of them and what i found very fascinating um, is that some tools have the possibility of translating. So I had a text that was in French and in the case of the first video that I'm going to show you, they just translated my text to English right away without me asking them, which was fine because 
they didn't offer the French version for voiceover and video, but at the same time, I thought, mm, um, what matters to me is the uh, quality of sound. And the image is, it's not me who chose them. So I'll show you these excerpts. I won't show you the whole thing because I don't want it to be too long. So just to show you, you know, I gave them this text in French, he translated it, they, the machine translated it, and then, you know, the quality of sound and the expression of the comedian that did the verbatim, you feel like it's a person who's sitting right beside you, you know, it's fluid, it goes very well, and you see some initial mm, pictures to uh, look at a certain working environment, and they had this mini storytelling. Um, talking about Sam, Sam works in this environment, and he has to do this and that, and so it was very interesting. Now, uh, Synthesia is a, an application that allows you to um, have avatars from the start, right? And I will tell you what my impression is after showing you the result. So this example here, uh, I apologize for the sound that's a bit lower. I had to um, do a screen print to show you. This This is an avatar that was generated through computer, through the computer. Uh, the voice is very generic, right? So you can notice that it is uh, AI generated. And uh, French, I was able to choose it when I generated the video. It is interesting. There is this... Um, uh, avatar that is at, at the front, I can see that this is used in the uh, in the journalistic and environment uh, field um, a bit, but I still found that the result was a bit too robotic, so I didn't meet my needs. It wasn't satisfying to me. Uh, I went out and tested another one that I will show to you now. So it's uh, our one Lumen 5. Uh, so yeah, it's Lumen 5 that is now called our one. So you have other applications that are available to you um, or new, new options that are available to you in that uh, application. Now, they're very user-friendly, they're very intuitive, and what is proposed to you when you input your text is to cut uh, the scenes yourself, right? Uh, so, they were telling me right away, your text is much too long for us to produce just one, one sequence with it. So, we're going to propose to you a certain um, the structure, certain characters, and we're going to cut out different scenes from it. So this gives you an overview. The translation uh, in the free version wasn't available, so it's in English. So in the case of this video, I didn't, or I couldn't have it in French, so I used a translator and then um, obtained the right formulation, the right uh, phrasing. Uh, I inputted the text. What I found is that the pace, the reading pace of the actor is much too quick. There are certain uh, applications that allow you to add some commas, some pauses, uh, 
I didn't go further to see if I was able to do it myself or how difficult that would be. But you see that there is a mixture of um, actors and uh, graphic presentations. This was kind of a, like a long haul uh, task. And since I didn't have access to the French version, I thought that it may not be the right tool or the tool that's at the right stage of development to really help me. So um, Alexandre, I will hand the floor back to you for the fourth practice-based story. You'll see that this one is a lot uh, more simple, um, but it is another example of a use that you can make of AI. So uh, this is brainstorming with AI. Um, also, Alexandre, uh, there's gonna be many questions that will require some development. So if you could just accelerate, um, it will allow us to cover more questions. They're very interesting. All right, with great pleasure. Uh, so basically we built at our college a space that was uh, destined uh, for experimentation, for um, pedagogical advisors. You would have a light board, uh, video um, production. Uh, and this is a space that will welcome uh, teachers at the college. And uh, for now, um, it has, it only has an, or the name of this space is only the, the number of the room. And we weren't able to come up with a nice name for this space. So uh, what we did is that we used ChatGPT. And right away we thought, all right, they're gonna come up with a lot of names to and as we went forward, we realized that the challenge was not really the names that was come up with, but it was more about how it allowed us to identify what we wanted in our name, what we didn't want in our name, right? At the beginning, we thought uh, it would be cool to have a kind of acronym that you can, uh, that you can you know, say as a word that could be articulated as a word, right? Um, so there is this uh, notion of a bridge that came out and then there was this uh, question of novelty that would come out also. So the newness, but you know, it's nice to say something's new, but in three years, it's not renew anymore. So it doesn't really make sense. And so we had all these premises that we would exchange about, Catherine and myself, we sent some um, queries, some requests uh, to come up with a preliminary list. And you can see uh, that uh, this is a recurring topic to um, say that we bring all of this process, all of this content back to humans. You sit as a committee and you discuss whatever comes out of the AI process. Uh, so we uh, sat together and we all left the meeting with the material to reflect on. So this was all meant to come up with a name for that space that is going to be open soon. So this leads me to presenting a first conclusion that will be temporary. Um, but, you know, this whole reflection that we're having about AI is based on concrete cases uh, concrete situations, but the, the thing is AI is there. We can't uh, close our eyes. Uh, it's going to be part of our practice. It's going to be part of our life, whether we like it or not. But what we wanted to illustrate here is that we need to integrate AI respecting our own rhythm, uh, our own pace, right? And so we realized that there were some tasks that we were ready to delegate to AI that we were comfortable saying that we're going to let AI do, but there might be some tasks that we don't want to delegate to AI that we want to keep for ourselves. And it's not always comfortable to uh, give some of our own tasks to a machine, but this is an ongoing reflection that we're going to have. Um, if you are a pedagogical advisor and you need to be assisting your teachers, you really need to get your um, teachers involved in the process and you really need to think with them. And uh, listen to your uh, environment. And uh, this is what Catherine and myself did at the college recently. Uh, you know, you need to take people where they are at. You know, if someone uh, says, no, I don't want to work on the lesson plan with this tool, fine, 
it's fine that's not where they're at so you know just go about developing your uh, literacy, your uh, consciousness, your awareness actually of these tools. And perhaps you'll never be ready to use it for uh, the elaboration of lesson plans, but you may be interested in using it for other things. So um, it's not about being on board or not being on board. It's just about uh, seeing what your taste for risk is, uh, your taste for uh, exploration is. And if uh, you're not ready to get into one thing, it's fine, right? And as you said, Alexandra, at the technological level, uh, we spoke about it a lot um, in the transition that took place with COVID. You know, these uh, uh, small step strategies are important. The thing is, like, you need to start slowly and see how these tools can serve you well or not. And yourselves as teachers or pedagogical advisors, um, you can notice that this field is evolving so quickly, so quickly that in the end, you need to always go back to basics, right? Like the fundamentals and the foundations, ask yourselves, what do I need? What is the best tool? Do I uh, put together this this tire, this kind of like tool library that I'm going to be able to use and go to? And I know that this um, today I need to work on an image. I need to this, that. And I just have this tool library. Make sure that I have the best tools for myself in them. And I go back to them and I update this tool library, for example. Or how am I going to work, right? The point is not to... Um, well, it always depends on the production, right? But it, it the point is not always to uh, take whatever the machine produced and use it as is. It's always about taking a step back and um, critically assessing what is proposed to you. Ask yourself if, this, if the content is good, if it meets your need and what you want to do afterward with it. So these are the elements that are key and that uh, help you determine whether a tool can help you with a task. Uh, these tools are accelerators, actually. Um, the thing is, you can uh, now avoid uh, these tasks that don't really rely on your added value as a uh, pedagogical expert. You know, you can automatize certain tasks um, lift a part of the burden off of yourself to uh, really use your skills where they're really worth investing. So you um, start with some ideas and you enrich them. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, Alexandre and Catherine, in the Q&A, it was very, very interesting, your presentations, by the way, but in the Q&A, there are two types of questions that come up very often. It has to do with ethical issues linked with the use of AI and also the quality of the information that is provided. Um, for example, with ethical aspects, Christian Girard is asking, what do you think about the fact that images and tests provided by AI are based on um, text and images uh, that belong to other people, right? They're question of intellectual ownership. Also, Ariane is asking, um, don't you think that it's important uh, to consider that AI, whilst trying to simplify the resources that are provided, is dropping a lot of nuances and details that are crucial, very important. Um, also, uh, issues uh, about AI using art uh, from artists that already have a hard time uh, living off of their work. So have you had a reflection on uh, ethical issues, but also um, issues of quality of information right well of course when we speak about quality of information basically speaking about output what you uh, receive when you use a prompt uh, basically is that it's obvious to me that you can't use these tools without subsequently verifying this information. You can't just prompt uh, ChatGPT or any generative AI um, and then use whatever it comes up with uh, without thinking about it. You know, uh, no, you need to look at it. And obviously, uh, sometimes we went back to our source documents to to pull out that nuance, to really obtain the precision that we're looking for. The operation that it allowed us was just to, um, w w was just to raise, you know, the 
the most important topics. Uh, and uh, of course, you can drop some material. There is some content tent may uh, go under radar. Some content may be less nuanced in the presentation provided by AI, but um, it is it is a fact. Uh, so it is important to just see how, to what extent AI can support us. Um, this is still a question up for debate, right? And for ethical purposes, well, um, it is still a challenge. It is still an issue, a challenge that we need to have in mind. Um, we were asked, uh, for example, how we'd use AI to build this presentation and the images that we use, etc. We didn't use a generative AI to present this um, presentation. This is pure human work. The images are generated. Um, I found them in a database, like an image database, uh, where you know the creators put them there. Um, and uh, these generators are often based on other things, on other material, and that is an issue. It is a challenge and an issue, and we won't pretend that it's not. But um, with regards to this question of seeing well, how do you manage that? Well, the, for example, the fact that it could uh, take work away from people who are trying to live off of this. Well, yes, of course, it is true. And I'm not going to uh, bury my head in the sand. It is the reality. But at the same time, I am putting myself in the shoes uh, of Catherine. Um, and I'll let you answer afterwards, Catherine, right? We're uh, in a small college with a little resources where we don't necessarily have, yeah, the funds to go get people to produce these uh, videos. We don't necessarily have the time ourselves to produce them. Um, so AI may come and um, give us a hand, but we must keep in mind, and, and also, uh, Catherine, you may uh, bring some more position to this, but it is not something that we uh, that we submitted to production. Right? Well, actually, you brought a lot of uh, very relevant elements with regards to all of this. Um, I would get back to this uh, issue of the images and the videos, right? Um, we're speaking about uh, resources that are available in terms of human resources, in terms of financial resources, and of the types of ca or, or, or video, um, the types of videos that are available to us. And at some point, you know, depending on the nature and the type of, of, of videos, it can allow us to do things quickly and well. Um, without putting too much burden on ourselves, because if not, it would have been us who would have had to to do it ourselves using our own images, or our own voices, and uh, it would have been very uh, tedious. It required a lot of work from ourselves. And at the same time, it looks very professional. You know, if we'd had to set up a studio and do these videos ourselves, it would have taken us a whole day or two days. And we're um, talking about here a small steps approach, right? But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves what the rendering uh, is that we want to achieve. So when there is an initial evaluation or uh, an initial assessment of the needs in a project, um, you you can make sure that you uh, bring in the right mom the right people at the right moment right so uh, you can state what your needs are and you can uh, ask yourselves if it's time to use these tools if it's the proper um if it's the relevant moment to use this or this tool if it's within your financial uh possibilities to do so and um, so because even in this this whole question of postures and impostures well um, we test the videos, we test the text that we receive, and we're always asking ourselves if we're doing the right thing, if we should use these tools. Every time we ask ourselves, uh, if I use this tool, um, what is going to be the impact on my tasks, on my on, on my work, you know, my position, and also what is going to be the impression that I'm going to um, give, you know, am I going to look like someone who's cheating? Is this going to look like plagiarism? So all these ethical questions are very uh, important to explore. They need to emerge. And it's going to be very important for us to establish what in our area, in our fields, 
um, is acceptable, not acceptable, what are the gray zones that we find are acceptable. And because this is emerging, uh, this is why we need to keep going uh, or have an ongoing discussion surrounding these tools and these challenges. So if I go back to the title of your presentation, um, the use of AI at the college level, posture or imposture, you don't feel like imposters, right? You have an open posture, an open position, while still tr making sure that you don't become imposters by abiding by certain rules and guidelines, inspiring yourselves um, from the materials, and also observing that given the limited resources and the potential that is offered by these tools, you do feel comfortable using them. And I, I also, I would like to get back to a question that was asked by, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name, say your name well, by Christine Valden how to you, uh, use AI without getting lost in a whole cognitive, uh, in, uh, without getting lost in the whole cognitive process yourself? Very good question. And I don't know for Catherine, but myself, I don't have the answer. Then this is really what is feeding our reflection, right? And um, when, as you are sacrificing a part of your tasks, a part of your cognitive process um, to this machine, when do you become an imposter? When do you start failing your duty um, as a thinker? When do you become only part of the machine right when do you when do you lose your raison d'être when do you become obsolete your yourself when you use ai and so this is a very rich path for discussion reflection we could have used a, a question mark at the end of our title as well you know um ai use in college a question mark we presented this as an affirmation but actually we're not here to tell you hey, use AI. No, we're here to tell you, be critical with AI. There are some cases that are very Ill illustrative, um, but it is important to determine what is useful and what it is useful to sacrifice to AI and what is it, what's going to make us um, or what's going to give us a possibility of really uh, using AI to become better ourselves. It always needs to be a support for us it can't come and replace us. Okay, thank you. And last question is a very pragmatic. Are tools, are these tools free? That is Xavier Martel Lachance, who provided a link um, that gives a price for certain uh, AI tools. So I'm going to place it in the chat right now. And um, thank you to both of you. Thank you. And uh, this was very informative, very instructive, and what I really wish for this is to uh, generate discussion and uh, just go out and look, explore, and see how you can get benefits, benefits from using these tools in your ideation processes. I find that AI is a great idea generating tool. I have, you know, my, um, I have my online, my digital dictionary. I can click on the word on the next one, whatever, and really start exploring a lot of content. Um, but it is very, very useful. And it is important to always maintain, however, uh, a, a discussion or reflection regarding the impact that these tools can have on us, our daily life, and our relationship with others. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of the participants. This was a very, very informative instruction. I hope that I will get the pleasure of um, meeting you once again very soon. So thank you to each and every one of the participants. Uh, very well, Catherine, you will send me the link for the new slide deck. I will share it in PDF with the participants as soon as I can. And uh, I wish you both a great journey and continuing your work, uh, yourself, Alexandre, at the uh, Ministère de l'Enseignement Supérieur, and yourself, Catherine, in your work at the Cégep de Grande Bay. So thank you very much uh, to uh, everybody who participated in this organization.